This afternoon I have with me Bertram Badre from Blue Like an Orange Sustainable Capital. Bertram, it's great to have you here. Could you tell us a bit more about yourself? Well, thank you, Kate. I'm Bertrand Badré. I'm 54. I spend most of my life outside the uh, private world, actually. I've been uh, running large banks. I was managing director of the World Bank. And six years ago, I made a decisive shift. I created with my partners Blue Like and Sustainable Capital to invest in sustainable development in emerging and developing economies. Thank you. And let's go into the first question. So how much is ESG an opportunity versus being an obligation or a duty? Well, I have a very mixed feeling with ESG. On the one hand, I believe it's a, it's a nice way to socialize the fact that we have a social problem, an environmental problem, a governance problem. So I think it's a nice way to explain to people that, I mean, our world is not that perfect and we should take into consideration other things. The big issue and the big limits with ESG are many faults. On the one hand, it can become a bureaucratic monster, so you fill pages of questionnaire and you lose sight of the big picture. You don't, remember, you don't really understand why you have to answer this question or this question. Is it important or not? But you have to fill the questionnaire. Uh, on the other hand, you also can argue that ESG is aspirational. It's more like, oh, I want to do the good things. But you don't commit to a result. You don't commit to an impact. You don't commit to being audited on your intention, etc. So it's still very foggy, it's still very foggy. So again, I don't want to throw the baby with the, the, the water of the hot tub, but I think it's, it's not where we need to be. So I don't want to spend too much time on ESG, I really want to focus on what comes next, which for me is impact. And when you think about impact, where are the real opportunities? Well, they are everywhere. Now, first of all, uh, I, I think we have, and it's what I'm trying to do, uh, I don't want to uh, gives the idea that there is a finance with impact and a finance without impact. That there is a sustainable finance and unsustainable finance. If we move in that direction, we are dead. Because then people will be satisfied with putting a few dollars or a few euros in the nice bucket and do the dirt things on the other side, but feel better because they do the right thing from time to time. My objective is really to change finance from inside and that it will take time in 10 years, 20 years, all of finance is impactful, all of finance is green, all of finance is uh, sustainable. So, but it's hard because it will not come overnight. It, it, it really means uh, opening the hood, taking the toolbox and say, OK, what does it mean from an accounting standards perspective? What does it mean from a compensation policy perspective? What does it mean from a governance perspective? What does it mean from a fiduciary duties perspective and so on and so forth? And that's, I think, what we have to start if we are serious, the valuation metrics. The risk return equation, all this has to be questioned if we want to go to impact. If not, we'll continue to fool ourselves. And I want to talk to you a bit more about cheap leverage. What do you think about the industry's reliance on it? What's the alternative and where do you see that going? Well, I, see, I think uh, leverage is, is, a, is a critical instrument. I remember the way I discovered leverage in business school 30 years ago, I was fascinated. And uh, I saw that leverage could bring you to the stars or to hell, depending on how you control. And it's true that leverage is a, is a byproduct of the system as we know it. I mean, when we entered in 1970s, 1980s into what I've called the Friedmanian uh, world, basically a world where the social purpose of business is to increase its profits, where you have to open the borders, you have to free capital flows, etc. Leverage comes naturally after that. And I think leverage is on the one hand positive, because it, it allows you to, to, to basically go faster and do bigger things. On the other hand, it's a dangerous disease. And so I, I think we have, in particular in the private world, to, to be cognizant of this fact and, and to use responsibly leverage. I think this is extremely important. So I don't want to enter into the questions whether the rates are moving up, the, 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 the quantity of credit is drying up, etc. For, for me, it's, 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 a, it's a modality. The real question is, how much leverage do we need for this world? And that's the question that we've not really touched, not really answered. So we see uh, the, the amount of debt as a percentage of GDP grow year after year after year. 100% of the global GDP, 200%, 300%, 400%. Where do we stop? And when it comes to the wider industry, how are you thinking about norms and standards and how you expect them to evolve in the coming months and years ahead? For me, I, I, I connect this to my point on impact. Uh, that's precisely the point I raised. Norms and standards are essential. 
I mean, let's face it, we are in a world where people need to, to, to industrialize process. And to industrialize process, you have to follow procedures. And to follow procedures, you have to follow you know, notes and say, I have to do this, 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 and this. So I think it's important. So we should not dismiss that. But the point is, these norms and standards will largely decide what our life will be in 10 and 20 years. So I don't want this to be left to technicians. It's not just to the big four or to the McKinsey of this world to decide this. It's to all of us. It should be chosen democratically. Let me take you a practical example on diversity. I've been living in the US for many years. I just relocated to France. In, in the US, diversity is mostly in people's mind about uh, ethnic diversity. And so if you do a good ethnic policy in a company, you got a good grade from an ESG or impact perspective. Whereas in France, it's forbidden to discuss ethnicity. So by control, you have a bad grade. I, I mean, maybe the fact that France does not discuss ethnicity is bad or wrong, but I don't want to be, this to be uh, dis decided by uh, Bloomberg or S&P or whoever. I want this to be discussed in my parliament. Uh, and so these questions are, are, are extremely important. So, that's really the first set is what are we talking about? Then I think the second step is what is the value of all this? It's one thing to say is this company is bad because it's emitting X ton of CO2 and uh, destroying X square meter of biodiversity or has a too big gender uh, gap, etc. That's okay, you can put this in the appendix of the report. The question is what do you do with that? I mean, if you, if you increase the size of the annual report from 1,000 pages to 2,000 pages, Sometimes I say it's going to be written by chat GPT and read by chat GPT and nobody will read it. The point is, how do you value this? Do you put a price tag on this? And then do you incorporate this in your accounts? So that's probably a 30, 40 years work ahead of us. But that's really, it's not just standard on norms. It's, it's really reshuffling the system so that the whole system is moving in this direction we are, we are wishing for, the, for our economy. And finally, let's talk emerging markets. Where are you seeing that opportunity and how are you thinking about where in the industry can go and how PE can be placed within the emerging markets landscape? For me, it's, it's, it's extremely interesting because emerging markets are still very marginal mm. in finance. Few percentage points of global allocation from whatever perspective you take. So it's very small, uh, despite the fact that emerging markets represent 50% of the global economy. So that's, that's an issue. When you say the, the basics of finance is to diversify, you should diversify more than 5% versus 50%. So that's point number one. Point number two, in 2015 in Paris on, on climate and in 2015 in New York on sustainable development, we've committed to a global change of the economy. And for me, the battle of climate, the battle of biodiversity, the battle for gender, all these battles that we've chosen to fight for humanity, will not be lost or won in Brussels, will not be lost or won in Paris, in Cannes or in Washington. They'll be lost or won in Brasilia, in Lagos, in Delhi, in Cairo. And that's not where we are heading to. So the point is that on emerging markets, there is, a, there is real risk. I don't want to dismiss that. I mean, it's, it's more risky, but perception matters and perception say it's more risky than it is. So you have to address this. But my experience as Blue Icon Orange is that you can do good and do well. It's very funny because a number of people say, oh, Bertrand, you're investing in emerging markets, so you are doing philanthropy or humanitarian business. They can't believe you can make real money. But the reality is that we have returns which are commensurate with the risk we are taking, and we have impact. So the problem is to, to say, yes, we can do it. And it's great for, from a financial perspective, and on top of that, it's great for the world because, again, it's great that Europe will, will decrease its CO2 emission, but at the same time, uh, the India and, and Nigeria or Brazil double or triple them. It doesn't make any sense. So how do we onboard everybody? It's a planetary issue. And so since pri private markets tend to, be, tend to pretend they are the most effective, they should embrace the planet, not just their little garden. Thank you so much. Thank you very much.